All right, GI tract. So the the digestive system. So this is the various these are the various learning objectives. So list the functions of the digestive system. Explain the process of peristalsis. So we already talked about that previously. We'll talk about it again today. Differentiate between mechanical and chemical digestion. List the structures that make up the monogastric stomach, and describe the function of each. Describe the structure and functions of the rumen, reticulum, omasum, and abomasum and list the segments of the small and large intestine and describe their general functions. So lots of learning objectives for the digestive system. So when we're talking about the digestive system, a couple ways to, uh, or sorry, a couple other terms that we can use to name it, as with anatomy, there are always about 15 ways to label one thing. So digestive tract, also called gastrointestinal tract. So Gastro is referring to the stomach, intestinal is referring to the small and large intestine. Alimentary canal, the gut, and it's within the visceral cavity. When we talked about the thorax, we talked about the pleural cavity. So again, it's the differentiation. The pleural cavity is that of the thorax, and visceral is that of the abdomen. In the abdomen itself, um, you can't see it on this dog, but there's a lining called the peritoneum. And it's kind of like the pleura in the uh, thorax. And it's a lining that encapsulates every organ within the ab abdomen. And essentially the GI system is a tube that runs from the mouth to the anus and it has accessory digestive organs. Lots of different species variations with this particular anatomical structure or area, um, anatomical area I suppose. Different requirements for digestion and absorption of foodstuffs. It's all going to vary depend on the type of diet the animal eats. So if you think about it quite clearly, uh, cows eat quite a different diet than dogs and cats. Monogastric animals are simple, single stomachs, broken down further into foregut fermenters and hindgut fermenters. So carnivores and omnivores like us, those are foregut fermenters. Horses and rodents are hindgut fermenters. Rodents, or sorry, ruminants, multiple mixing and fermentation compartments in addition to the stomach. So that's why we say that typically cows have four stomachs. They have four chambers that the food passes through before it gets pushed into the small intestine. <coughs> so the functions of the digestive tract are prehension, so grasping of the food with the lips, tongue, or teeth, mechanical breakdown of food, chemical digestion of food, absorption of nutrients in water, and elimination of weight, uh, waste. The buccal cavity is basically referring to the mouth in general. And with the mouth, we have the lips, tongue, teeth, salivary glands, hard palate, soft palate, and oropharynx. The salivary glands produce saliva, and usually there are three pairs of ducts that carry the saliva into the oral cavity. So having a look at the next image, this is a good one to know. So the cats have four specific glands, um, three of which are more or less connected towards the base of the skull. So they have the zygomatic gland, the parotid gland, mandibular gland, and sublingual gland. Really important point is this mandibular gland right here. It's located at the, the very base of the mandible on either side. So right where the mandible curves upward toward the ears. And it's also in the very same area, or very similar area, as the submandibular lymph nodes. So the submandibular lymph nodes, um, they're there to filter out debris, vi viruses, bacteria. They get swollen when there's something passing through them. So they can get a, an inflammatory reaction if the animal has an upper respiratory disease, or lymphoma is one that we see it commonly with. So just a key point here is to note that if... The technician or veterinarian is feeling a very swollen submandibular lymph node on just one side in particular. It can in fact be a blocked mandibular gland, so it can be a blocked salivary gland. And that's called a salicyl or a mucosyl, we'll talk about that in fourth semester a bit more. But it's a lot better prognosis to have a blocked salivary gland than it is to have lymphoma. So it's just one of those things that when you test with a, a needle to draw some cells out, see what they're seeing, it can easily be seen as a, a blocked salivary gland rather than um, lymphoma or a swollen lymph node. So teeth are there for mastication, so chewing, physically break down food into smaller pieces, and then of course the saliva that we talked about in the previous slide 
works on the basis of chemical digestion as well. So it has various enzymes that help break down those starches in the food. Ruminants, when we're looking at ruminants, they don't have upper incisors or upper canine teeth. So here's an example. This is a goat. So they have, uh, depending on the species, they have lower incisors to various numbers. <clears throat> and rather than having teeth on the top, they have molars back here. But rather than having incisors and canine teeth, they have this thick connective tissue structure on the maxilla. And that's called the dental pad. Horses, and you'll learn about dentition a little bit more as you get into school in the third semester, I think, with Jocelyn. Um, horses have molars, premolars, and some horses have canines and some horses have wolf teeth. So various types of teeth, um, peg teeth and wolf teeth and canines, people tend to call them the same names interchangeably, but technically wolf teeth are with the premolars and the canines a little bit more rostral. Um, most oftentimes horses are born without canines and without wolf teeth and the wolf teeth in particular if you look at the image of the horse skull there they're most often pulled when the horses are young if there's any chance that that horse will be wearing a bit and a bridle because they can actually interfere and cause more damage than good so it's just an evolutionary trait that they they've lost those teeth over time <clears throat> Oral cavity functions, so prehend the food, mechanical digestion, chemical digestion. Um, and then, chem uh, sorry, prepare the food for swallowing. So just to note, the autonomic nervous system controls most of the glands in the digestive system. The parasy parasympathetic stimulation increases salivation. Anticipation of eating can cause parasympathetic stimulation of the salivary glands. So that's that Pavlov's dogs, um, the psychologist... If you train a dog to know what a treat is after a while, right, or eventually you can generalize that salivation, they're salivating with the treat constantly, they're seeing the treat, they're salivating. Um, if, if you pair it with something else, so a treat and a pat, eventually that dog will start salivating with a pat. I don't know if anybody else studied Pavlov, but pretty cool. Anyways, uh, salivation can occur even with the thought of food, so that's what I was trying to say there. The sympathetic nervous, stimula or nervous system stimulation decreases salivation, and fear or parasympathetic nervous system inhibitors like atropine produce dry mouth. And you'll talk about those a lot in third semester in surgery because sometimes we give atropine as part of a pre-anesthetic uh, cocktail. So the digestive tract structure is important to know about. So the mucosa is the innermost lining of the GI tract. There's epithelium and loose connective tissue. Submucosa is dense connective tissue, and it may contain glands. Muscle layer is outside the submucosa. And the serosa is the outermost layer, so the thin, tough connective tissue. This picture is really good. We talked about it in lab. Um, just gives you an idea. So there's a condition that animals get called foreign body, and it's one that they've induced themselves. So foreign body means that an animal has eaten something, whether it be a string, a piece of plastic, a bone, that won't pass through the GI system. So it gets stuck, and it gets stuck either in the stomach or small intestine or large intestine. So with that, number one clinical sign is vomiting. The animal will eat and vomit because they can't pass anything through, so everything starts to come back up. And then generally they lose their appetite altogether, they become dehydrated, they become quite lethargic. And the foreign body is typically diagnosed on x-ray, but sometimes the veterinarian actually has to go in surgically to even see what could possibly be blocking the intestines or stomach. So that being said, during surgery, so when we remove these foreign bodies, it's important to know that um, in the GI system in general, the small intestine and large intestine, there's extreme amounts of bacteria. So that's where all the bacteria naturally sits in our body, is in that, uh, especially in the large intestine. So when a veterinarian goes into surgery, removes the foreign body from the intestines, they have to be very, very, very careful to ensure that they're suturing up each layer of the intestine itself or of the stomach because if they leave a gap or if the tissue hasn't opposed properly and it leaves a little slit then essentially you're going to get bacteria and if it's the stomach you can get gastric juices leaking into the abdomen which can cause a really 
horrific peritonitis. So again, that peritoneal um, lining that I talked about earlier can get really inflamed, very painful, and uh, the worst case scenario is sepsis. So when they suture it up, they have to go through all those layers, ensure that each layer is attached quite tightly and uh, perfectly. So the digestive tract musculature, the majority of the musculature involved in the digestive tract is the visceral smooth muscle, and it works with peristalsis, so in those big waves, okay? You, there's also skeletal muscle, and that's typically around the mouth and the pharynx and the cranial portion of the esophagus. There are also skeletal muscles in the <clears throat> external anal sphincter, so down at the very terminal portion of the GI system. So this is that same picture of peristalsis, just identifying how the contraction occurs behind the bolus of food, pushing it forward and down through the GI tract. All right, this is a great chart to get to know. It's really important, and it gives you a good idea in the monogastric um, foregut fermenter species, such as carnivores and omnivores, of which areas do what. So the stomach is responsible for mechanical and chemical breakdown of carbohydrates and proteins. Three main compartments are the fundus, the body, and the pyloric antrum. The small intestine is mostly the enzymatic digestion of proteins, carbs, and fat, and a little bit of absorption. So the duodenum, also called the duodenum or the duodenum, it's up to you how you'd like to pronounce it, most digestion occurs here. So that's a key point. Most digestion occurs in the duodenum. Sodium bicarbonate is received from the pancreas, which is a very small accessory organ that's attached to the duodenum. So the sodium bicarbonate is uh, released from the pancreas and dumped into the duodenum to help alkalinize, so to bring down the acidity that from the gastric contents. So in the stomach, there's lots of hydrochloric acid that's being released to help break down that food. By the time it gets to the duodenum, it needs to be more alkaline so that it's not going to go ahead and burn uh, the rest of the GI tract. <clears throat> The jejunum, some digestion and some absorption occurs, and the ileum is mostly absorption. Large intestine is absorption of water, that's its number one role. Electrolytes and vitamins, there's bacteria there to assist with further breakdown, and the bacteria itself can create vitamin K, which is kind of cool. The cecum is almost non-functional in monogastric species, so that's really good to know. Um, in monogastric for gut fermenters, let me clarify that. And the colon is bacterial activity, water absorption, and waste storage. That should say waste, not waster. The rectum is waste storage as well. And the anal is the terminal portion of the GI tract. It has an internal and ex external sphincter, so it's a muscular ring that allows for the passage of feces. The internal sphincter, sphincter is on autonomic control, so they don't have voluntary control of the, the internal sphincter. The external sphincter they have voluntary control over. However, if they hold it too long and they gotta go, then they suddenly start to lose that control. All right, so these are just <clears throat> some examples of <coughs> monogastric foregut fermenters. So a pig, which we don't talk about swine too much in the program. We've got pug, oh, pugs in a blanket, okay? <laughs> Check out the look on his face, looking at his buddy recovering from anesthetic. And then, of course, my favorite cat, Moose, um, is also a monogastric foregut fermenter. And that's Moose's plate of dirty food, quite clearly. <laughs> All right, so this is the stomach of monogastric species in general, uh, foregut or hindgut. There isn't too much difference between the two in regard to the stomach. So the esophagus enters the stomach on an angle in the cardia region. It's surrounded by the cardiac sphincter muscle. As the stomach expands, the fold of the stomach against the esophagus closes the lower end of the esophagus. So that happens right here at the cardial notch. So the food comes down the esophagus in a big bolus, enters the cardial region of the stomach. When it gets full, the fundus has an extremely 
high or uh, great ability to expand. It has a ton of surface area that's kept together in little folds. So when the stomach fills, the fundus will expand quite significantly and that pushes against the cardia and at that cardial notch, it actually folds. So that generally prevents acid reflux from happening. So it prevents the contents of the, the stomach from coming back up and burning the esophagus. However, we all know that in carnivores and humans as well, we, we do get acid reflux. So the that closure of the stomach to the esophagus isn't that strong in in um, for gut fermenters, so uh, generally carnivores and omnivores. In some species, typically hind gut fermenters, such as the horse, rabbit, rat, that cardial notch is so strong when it closes, so the fundus pushes right up against the esophagus, that notch, that fold is so, so strong when it closes that the animal can't actually vomit. So rats, horses, rodents, they do not vomit. So clinical application, if you ever have a client who calls you to say that their rat just vomited, they should probably come in right away. All right. Gastric, oh dear, my voice is going. Gastric motility, you'll learn a little bit more about in radiography when you get there. So we talk about gastric motility in regard to illness. So is the animal emptying its stomach contents at an ideal rate? And we have ways to track that. So overall, the visceral smooth muscle in the stomach wall responds to hormones, peptides, and nervous system controls. Parasympathetic stimulation causes the fundus to relax and increases contractions in the antrum of the stomach. Sympathetic stimulation can cause a decrease in motility, also called called gastric atony. Okay, so that means that it stops emptying. So peristalsis is slowed down, and the food stuffs, once it's past the stomach, called chyme, C-H-Y-M-E, no longer is emptying at the appropriate rate into the duodenum. So this is a picture of Ruge. So just going back, remember how I was saying that the fundus can expand almost exponentially. It can get really, really big in size. It's like when we eat way too much Thanksgiving dinner or, or Christmas or holiday dinner and we feel sick to our stomachs because we've eaten too much, right? Our, our stomach has expanded that much. So Ruge are the folds in the stomach and we'll talk about them as well when we get to the ruminant stomach because because uh, they have quite different ones too. So rugae are folds in the stomach and they allow for stretching and increases in surface area. So, so the benefit of having increased surface area is for increased nutrient absorption as well as to allow the stomach to stretch just to accommodate that incoming food. Not to be confused with reggae. So gastric dilatation volumus is one that's really important, and I recommend you click on this little GDV symptoms video here. So gastric dilatation volumus occurs typically in dogs, and it's in dogs anywhere from about like 65 pounds and up. So lab shepherds, uh, Great Danes are the number one dog breed to have this disease. Great Danes, it's about a 50-50 chance, even if all the precautions are taken, uh, that your dog will have gastric dilatation volvulus. So what it is, uh, the stomach is loosely attached to the abdominal wall by the omentum, so a large, broad sheet of connective tissue. In these dogs, if you can picture a Great Dane, they have an extremely large chest. So their chest is quite large, and then as you can imagine, it uh, moves upward dorsally to this tiny little tucked abdomen. Well, the stomach sits very close to the ribs in all animals, in, in uh, dogs and cats at least, sits quite close to the ribs. So what happens in these big guys is when they eat a meal, they can have some bloating for whatever reason. It could be just because they ate too much. It could be because they had some gas involved in the digestion process, so it bloats their stomach. And then if they're laying down after they eat and they get up, or if they ate a big meal and you send them out to play, that stomach is sitting <clears throat> in that deep chest like a hammock, like a hammock with a rock in it. So it's really, really heavy. It's swinging, it's swinging. 
and then all of a sudden it flips right over. So swinging hammock, swimming, swinging hammock, and then it flips right over and twists on either end. So it's twisted right over. So now you have the pylorus is cr almost cranial, and the cardial region is, um, is cut off circulation entirely. Okay, so this is a big problem. So what's happening now is the stomach is extremely bloated, and the blood supply has been cut off. So the number one clinical sign for this one is a dog who is restless and trying to vomit but not bringing anything up. Or trying to vomit and it's just bringing up foam. Okay, so the trying to vomit, so a non-productive vomit, is the number one sign. And then of course they're restless, they can't get comfortable, they don't know what to do. It's not ideal. So when you bring them into a clinic, uh, most often, most of them are quite bloated in the abdomen. They can have pale gums because they're also losing blood circulation and their vena cava, their uh, caudal vena cava often gets involved in the twist as well as the spleen. So they often look quite bloated. This is your fairly typical bloat, but don't be, don't stick by that. Don't only assume that they have to look extremely bloated in order to be a gastric dilatation volvulus. I had a dog in a few weeks ago, well, it was a while ago, who am I kidding? It was probably like six months ago at this time, and it was a giant Great Dane, classic signs of a GDV, it was trying to vomit, trying to vomit, restless as, as anything, wouldn't settle down, so we said, my gosh, it looks like a GDV, or it sounds like a GDV, it's displaying the signs of a GDV, however, it was not bloated at all, it was skin and bones, it was just, you could see every little anatomical structure. So we took an x-ray, and because that stomach sits so close to the ribs on most dogs, when this dog's stomach bloated, it pushed more cranially, and the stomach was actually entirely tucked up into the ribs. So I'm sure that dog also had trouble acquiring appropriate amounts of air as well. So this is a normal, this is a cat, but it's uh, replicated for the dog as well. This is a normal abdominal x-ray. This here is the stomach, and this stomach is in fact full of food. Normally the stomach is a very flat little pouch that sits pretty much in line with these ribs. This is the liver, kidney, and they have two kidneys. Uh, large intestine, large intestine, bladder, small intestine, spleen. This one is a perfect example of a gastric dilatation volvulus. So this is a right lateral x-ray and you just snap one shot of the abdomen and it has this huge black dark gaseous figure so it's filled with gas and it was once explained to me as Popeye's arm if you can picture it here's his little hand flexing his biceps okay and his head would be over here so that's your typical x-ray for gastric dilatation volvulus it's unfortunate um, treatment for that is surgery there's, if it's flipped, then you can't unflip it without going to surgery. So it's immediate surgery, and even after surgery, it's quite scary. They have about 12 hours where they're not stable at all, and their heart's involved. Um, they can have premature contractions in their heart, and they can actually go into cardiac arrest. So in young, healthy dogs, it's a great idea, if the owner can afford it, to go to surgery, flip the stomach. As long as the dog hasn't been bloated for too long, the stomach should be okay. But this is an emergency, so to get them in within an hour is the ideal. If you hear a weird noise, it's my bread maker. So, carrying on. Um, oh, sorry, I should go back. Sorry, one more thing. When they do the surgery, uh, the techs are often involved. We're always involved in anesthetic, and sometimes we actually glove up and help them flip the stomach back around. And we pass a stomach tube to help get rid of the stomach contents. But what also happens is once they flip that stomach back around is they do what's called a gastric pexy or a gastropexy. So they take a piece of the abdominal lining, so the epithelium in the abdomen, and sew it to the stomach. So it's on the dorsal wall of the abdomen, and the, the cranial dorsal wall of the abdomen, and they sew it to the stomach itself to help prevent it from flipping ever again. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And a lot of people who have Great Danes as well, if they have a female 
when we get the female spade, it's a it's an abdominal incision. So we go into the abdomen to look for the uterus and ovaries and that kind of thing. So a lot of times people who have puppy Great Danes will opt to have the gastropexy done at the time of spay to help prevent that. All right, small intestine. So the duodenum is the first short segment that leaves the stomach. The jejunum is the longest portion. And the ileum, I-L-E-U-M, is separated by the colon from the ileocecal sphincter. And that regulates the movement of materials from the small intestine into the colon or the cecum. So that specifically is the ileocecal sphincter. And just have a look here. This is the pancreas. So when I was talking before about the pancreas adding sodium bicarbonate to the duodenum, this is where the pancreas lies. It sits between the stomach and the first loop of the duodenum. So these are just some things that can go wrong because we all know I like to tell horror stories like that. <coughs> so this is called intussusception. And if you think about a periscope, so a periscope or a telescope, when you take it out and you extend it to look at something and then you collapse it upon itself, essentially that's what an intussusception is. So it's the small intestine or large intestine collapsed upon itself. And what that does is it creates a narrowing in the, in the intestine, so a stricture in the intestine, and doesn't allow for fecal movement to pass. This is most common in puppies with extreme diarrhea, or sorry, severe diarrhea, and or severe parasite burden. And that requires a surgery. So this is an x-ray <clears throat> of a linear foreign body. So we were ta I was talking earlier about foreign bodies when an animal eats something that doesn't pass through their GI system can cause problems and we have to go in surgically and remove it. A linear foreign body is the worst kind of foreign body. It's when an animal eats a string or something string-like. Because of the nature of peristalsis, essentially this string will get caught in one area of the GI tract the other end of the string will continuously move down the other end of the GI tract. And after a while, the, G, the small intestine or large intestine will accordion on itself on this string. So the string stays taut in the middle and the intestines have to accommodate and they become accordioned. Downfall of this is when it's accordioned on that piece of string, it can cause all sorts of microscopic or uh, just even very tiny little lacerations. So small cuts in the intestines all through the GI system. So it's no longer just a simple go in, get the foreign body, suture, get out. You then have to go through, cut the string in various places throughout the intestines and uh, suture up as they go, which is really, really complicated. So this would be a plicated gas pattern. So when we're looking for foreign bodies on x-ray, most often we're just looking for gas patterns. Okay, <clears throat> so abnormal gas patterns, which this is. And this is an example of that accordion. So the doctor here has their hand on uh, the string on one side and her hand on the string on the other side. And the intestines have been pulled <clears throat> keeping the string taut in the middle, peristalsis has continued, and it sort of pushed it to accordion on the GI tract. Okay, and that's a dog, it looks like, coming from the large intestine. That is a linear foreign body. So you can see that it's covered in chyme, so food material that's been passed through the stomach, and bowel movement, and then string. So as it's sitting in there, it's no longer just a string, but it's actually acquiring uh, tissue or bowel, t bowel movements as it gets digested. And then, of course, if you see an animal with a string in their mouth or a string coming out of their anus, you should never pull that string because we know that that string is, you can give it a very, very slight tug, and if it doesn't come out in the very first tug, don't keep pulling because that string is tucked and tangled up in the intestines. So cats, when we do physical exams, especially if it's a vomiting cat, we always check their mouth over their tongue and under their tongue for strings. <clears throat> if a client has an animal that has a string coming out of its rectum, definitely tell them that they need to come to the vet 
and then we'll start cutting and measuring the expelled material. So you just cut it until it passes. All right, so the small intestine, the mucosa. Um, mucosa in general, so the innermost lining of the small intestine has many folds, and it has these tiny little finger-like projections called villi. Okay, so villi, villi are really important. They have a blood supply. They have a lymphatic supply to them. And each villus contains thousands of microvilli, so tiny little brush borders. And actually, the, the small intestine especially is the number one immune defense uh, area in the body. So we always think, you know, it's our nose preventing bacteria from getting in, et cetera, et cetera. But the small intestine and the large intestine actually release all the, lymph the lymphocytes. They release a lot of lymphocytes <clears throat> that assist with immune function. So the small intestine especially, but in general, the mucosa and these little microvilli, they all are super important in the immune system and the defense mechanisms for the body. So small intestine digestion primary function is to absorb electrolytes, water, vitamins, and nutrients. There's enzymatic decomposition of chyme, and it continues with the mechanical breakdown of chyme. The large intestine involves the cecum, which is a blind sac, so it's just a sac, uh, more so than a tube, at the, and this is at the ileocecal junction. The colon, some microbial digestion, absorption of water and electrolytes, and the rectum. Species variation in structure of all of these, and the, in general, the, the colon, and especially the cecum, is very poorly developed in carnivores. So ileocecal junction. So we're just talking here, um, what this is pointing to is the ileocecal junction. So the small muscular sphincter between the ileum and the cecum in the dog and cat. Okay, this is a good image to get to know. Uh, the Just note that the esophagus starts off dorsally. So when we were talking about the larynx and the respiratory system, the esophagus sits dorsally. In the, in, the larynx, in the pharynx, sorry, so in the throat, and the trachea sits ventrally, however they crisscross. So then the trachea comes up and sits more dorsally, and the esophagus comes down uh, more ventrally to, to meet with the stomach. We'll look at x-rays with that. All right, so these are intestines. As you can imagine, this is small and large intestines mixed. So how does everything stay neat and organized in the abdomen? This is the big question of the day. So the abdomen, uh, and specifically the GI system, has mesentery. So there's this, if you look, so these are all the intestines. They're certainly not sausages, although that's what they look like. This connective tissue in the middle has vasculature. Okay, so vessels, fat, connective tissue, and lymphatic vessels as well, and lymph nodes. So that is called mesentery. And mesentery is suspended from the dorsal abdominal wall, and it connects all the inside of the intestines together. So it keeps it nice and coiled up so that during a surgery uh, or if the animal's running around, then their intestines won't just fold upon themselves and get tangled up. So the mesentery is incredibly important. Okay, so here's a closer look up. So it's extensions of ligaments, and they supply blood and lymphatic vessels to the abdominal organs. They maintain the organ shape by keeping them attached to the abdominal wall, so attached to the dorsal abdominal wall. It's kind of like the marionette strings for if the intestines were a puppet. So you can see this is the intestine. This is small intestine. And this is mesenteric arteries and there are mesenteric veins, connective tissue, and lots of fat around those arteries and veins, which I think you'll come to know by now. Fat often accompanies, accompanies arteries and veins and soft tissue to assist with protection and thermoregulation. The omentum, uh, which I don't have a picture of, is specific to the stomach, and it attaches the stomach to the abdominal wall. So the omentum is a large sheet of fat uh, that sits fairly ventrally in the abdomen, and it covers the stomach and the upper abdominal organs. 
So this is just a picture of the mesenteric arteries. Okay, so this would be sitting dorsally on the animal. <clears throat> this is a really fat cat. <laughs> All right, so monogastric herbivores, uh, also called hindgut fermenters, so they have a little bit of species variation in them that we'll talk about. So they have differences, and it's due to their high intake of fiber. So we've gotten rid of those differences over time uh, through evolution. And just a side note, horses and rodents in general can't go without food. Okay, they always have to have some form of food. So if you're ever putting a rabbit, a rat, a, um, a mouse, or a horse in a stall or in a cage, make sure that there's some hay or some pellets available to them. Reasons for this is that the hind gut, which we'll talk about, requires constant supply of protein and carbohydrates in order to sustain the little microbes that live there. If there's an area with an empty space, the gut can kink or twist, which causes colic. Okay, so their guts can actually kink or twist, which can cause uh, colic. So very, very painful, painful abdomen and essentially can need a surgery. So monogastric hind gut fermenters, mechanical and chemical breakdown of proteins and carbohydrates happens in the stomach. Three main compartments, so same as the others, fundus, body, pyloric antrum. Small intestine, enzymatic digestion of protein, carbs, and fats, as well as absorption. Duodenum, again, the most digestion occurs here. Sodium bicarbonates brought in from the pancreas. The fats emulsified by bile from the gallbladder. So just a side note, the gallbladder stores the bile. The liver produces the bile. The jejunum, some digestion and some absorption. Ileum is mostly absorption. The large intestine, mostly absorption of water, electrolytes, vitamins, bacteria, and assist with further breakdown. Again, they get vitamin K from the bacteria. So in this is where they differ, right here, the cecum. So in us and dogs and cats, the fecum is or the fecum, the cecum is very poorly developed. Okay, it doesn't do a lot of work. In hindgut fermenters, hence the name, hindgut, so the lower aspect of their gut. The cecum plays the main role in fermentation of carbohydrates and it secretes bicarbonate to buffer the acidic contents. So the, a lot of breakdown, <clears throat> enzymatic breakdown and fermentation occurs in the cecum. The colon, for these guys, it's broken down into ventral colon, dorsal colon, small colon, lots of bacterial uh, activity, water and electrolyte absorption and waste storage. And again, the rect rectum is for waste storage. And then the anus, there are internal and external sphincters, and it's exactly, well, it's similar to us. Um, yeah, it's similar to us. They have a little bit less control. So uh, on the, by us, I mean us and dogs and cats. So the internal sphincter, same thing under autonomic control. The external sphincter, it's under voluntary control. However, they have less control over the external sphincter as these animals are constantly eating. So they're constantly putting food into their system, so they constantly have to be pushing it out. So this is a very basic identification of foregut, stomach, esophagus, small intestine, versus hindgut, which is the large intestine. All right, so cecotropes or cecotrophs are animals that create a fecal pellet that's only partially digested. So they pass this fecal pellet, so they defecate, they poop. It's excreted and then eaten again for further digestion. How exciting. So this happens four to eight hours after eating. Examples of this are guinea pigs and rabbits are both cecotropic. So they will, you'll sometimes see them eating what looks like a fecal pellet. Uh, these other guys are not, but these are all hindgut fermenters. Not so much Ron Burgundy but everybody else on this page are hindgut fermenters. And this is a really good diagram to get to know. <clears throat> it's the large intestine and how it's broken down in the hindgut fermenter. So you can see, again, we talked about with carnivores, our colon, or sorry, our cecum is very poorly developed. In horses, it's quite extremely large. The body of the cecum carries on, the apex of the cecum. 
And this just demonstrates how it's a blind sack. So the cecum itself is a little sack where food goes down, gets fermented, comes back up, and carries on into the rest of the colon. Okay, and this is a nice diagram actually to get to know as well. All right, I'm going to stop there and make a separate video so I can collect my voice. So that is it for now.